third day of lightning talks. This will be the last round of these. Um, so first up, uh, we'll have Andy give a, a very special announcement, lightning talk. Uh, and then first up on deck is uh, Jake Vanderplas. Are you in the room right now? There you are. Yep. You can work up there. That's fine. Uh, and then second up is uh, no. So, thanks. Andy, I start. Right? Okay. Thank you so much for staying here. The fact that all of you are still here means that maybe you might sweat for SciPy as well as stay and listen to our talk. So I'm here to ask you to volunteer. It's everybody's favorite topic, and I tell people how we do it, and it's just like this, collaborative sausage making. <laughs> Except collaborative sausage making looks more like this today, a GitHub repository with too many re repos and lots of members. So we would love to run this member count from 24 to 400 at least, right? But anyways, but we do work on GitHub, and we definitely are looking for people to help and provide feedback to make this conference a better, bigger conference and more uh, diverse and welcoming to our entire community. Major points I'd like to make that are often confused by people is that this is a community con uh, conference with a corporate sponsorship. Uh, in thought is our institutional sponsor, but everybody here is a volunteer making this happen. This we do this intentionally to make, keep our prices low, so that we can have more scientists, more students, and everybody else uh, contribute. And often people tell me, "Well, what?" But you have a corporate. There's a corporate person behind him. I'm like, no, go look at OzCon if you want to see what a corporate conference prices. It's at least three or four times as much. Everything we've done, I said this again, we've, everything we do is volunteers, and we definitely need volunteers every year. We try to make sure that we have a good mix on our boards so that people keep on coming. So if you do it one year, you don't think that you have to do it every year. Um, that said, I've been doing it the last three years. Um, so, but, and the other th major point is that we have to start planning now. Um, we've grown to a point where we can no longer wait till January to start planning. Um, and I think that if we want to keep the quality that we have and we want to encourage everybody to get through their budget office, especially all you people at government labs, <laughs> they, they, you have to require, the government labs are now requiring many more days to, to get your talks through and so, or get your uh, funding through and things like that. So to talk about a little bit about the types of collaborate contribution we accept or that we have, we have different committees and um, we basically work through everything that happens here. Somebody has done something. The executive committee is the committee that uh, does most of the vision and most of the driving of things to today. We're trying to break those down into nugget sized pieces more and get more friendly for people to just provide small uh, attributes to, for example, I just want to run the poster session or I just want to run signs and things like that. It's not completely done. We need more people to help us bring uh, more contribution. But more or less you run, the executive committee runs call for proposals, ex executes reviews, builds all the websites, plans all the events, executes, pays people, signs contracts, everything you can imagine. And it's a lot of fun. The program committee is another committee that's uh, really great to be upon because these are the guys who keep our talks and our uh, posters at as high quality as possible. They work with our tutorial ch tutorials and, and everybody who gives any sort of presentation to, to uh, up, up the quality. And so if you really want to see the more uh, the reviews or more things inside what you do, uh, program committees are an excellent place to be. We do have a technical committee, and this is going to probably have to expand a little bit. Um, and we definitely always need people to help us implement our web presence better. Um, definitely, that's one thing that we always need better scaling on. And this year, we added a diversity committee to help cast a wider net to bring more people to a SciPy and and uh, from diversity in both gender and 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 uh, uh, excuse me the. Uh, scientific discipline and, play, for example, being more academic or more industry and academic partners and things like that. Um, the first thing you can do is join the mailing list. We do have a SciPy organizers mailing list. It has actually been public uh, for 
for this whole year. We tried, we're tried. we going to try it out. I think it's mostly working. Um, so you can go to um, the mailscipi.org mailman list. Okay, I'll tweet it. Um, <laughs> but join the mailing list. Um, ask how you can help. We are starting to try to find the committees right now in order to build out for next year, and we definitely need your help. Thank you very much. Thank you, Andy. Right, next up is uh, Jake, and I forgot my notes over here, so. Uh, on the dock is Kurt Smith. Cool. There we go. All right, so I'm going to talk briefly about MPLD3, which is a project I've been working on for the last six or seven months. Apologize if you were in the uh, visualization boff. This will be <laughs> kind of a repeat of what you heard earlier. So anyway, MPLD3 grew out of frustration with uh, kind of the current state of visualization in the Jupyter notebook. And um, basically, you know, we, we all know you can use matplotlib inline, you can create graphics and they're embedded there, but then frustratingly the graphics are just these PNGs and if you try to click and drag on them, um, you just have the, the picture that's moving around and that's not really helpful. Um, so what I did, I thought one, one day, why don't we just translate these to D3JS? So the result is here. You basically take the figure, you enable the notebook with MPLD3, and you get this thing right here with some controls, and now you can start zooming in on the plot, and it's just embedded there in, in the notebook. So this has been, uh, this has been pretty fun. So you might ask Jake, how, how does this work? What, what this is doing is it's using this package, MPL exporter, that I wrote for this purpose to scrape all the info from the matplotlib object and output a, a JSON representation of the figure. Um, and then uh, we can take a look at what the JSON looks like here. Just, this is basically the dictionary version. What we've done is encoded everything about the figure, everything that you need in there to recreate it, into this dictionary. And then um, from that, we have this 1,500-line uh, JavaScript library that, that interprets it and puts this all out there. So, you know, one, one thing that I've noticed is that the, you know, people who, people who love SciPy spend, or love Python, spend all their time writing Python programming. But the, the, the way that you know that someone is a, a SciPy developer is if they spend all their time writing JavaScript instead. Um, and I, I apologize if you've heard that joke before, but I'm really, really um, committed to reusability. Um, MPLD3 produces a it's a pure client-side view, which means that you don't need to be connected to a server. You can just stick it out on a static web page, um, and hopefully this will help people make their plots a little more, um, a little more uh, shareable. So there's more. This is the part that I'm really excited about, the plugins. The plugins are ways to add more interactivity to the graphs, and for an, as an example here, we can take the same plot we've been looking at, and just create some points, some labels for the points, and then we just connect those labels to the figure we already have. And now when you hover over the points, you get information about them. You can put whatever string or whatever, whatever info you want in there. Um, now that you can do some more complicated things, here's a, a linked brushing plugin that I made. So here's a bunch of uh, matplotlib code that just basically creates a, a grid of panels over the iris data. And then all we gotta do is you connect the linked brush plugin to those points, and then you get stuff like this where you can uh, highlight points and see what's going on in the rest of the plot. So this is pretty cool. I like that. And um, there are even ways to do custom plugins, and this looks really ugly because what you have to do is define a bunch of JavaScript that implements your plugin within a Python class. So if you really want to like go down the rabbit hole, you can do this. And this is a plugin that just basically uh, highlights lines as you go over them. So we have, we have plenty of examples of those, those sorts of things on the, on the website. You should check it out, um, and I hope you enjoy it. Thanks. Thank you. So s some shady health websites tell me that vitamin D3 is a pain reliever. Um, and you're certainly our dealer for that. <laughs> All right, next up is uh, Nell, and on the dock is uh, Sam Skillman. Come on. 
always exciting. So I think this is going to be the most boring lightning talk. Um, and I'm going to talk about EuroSciPy. I'm sure you have no idea what this is. So EuroSciPy is the European SciPy um, conference. And this year, um, it's happening in Cambridge, end of August. Um, so just to clarify, uh, by Cambridge, I mean Cambridge in the UK. So reminder, it's here. It's not in Massachusetts. Um, and so it's the first time it's happening in Cambridge, but um, we're all pretty excited to have it in an English-speaking country. So probably we'll have less people butchering the English language, but that's not even sure, because there'll be a lot of French people there, like me. Um, so SciPy is uh, shorter than, uh, Euro SciPy is shorter than SciPy. It's um, two days of tutorials with two tracks, two days of conferences with one track, which makes it really easier to choose which track to follow, um, and one day of sprints. Um, we also have two keynotes. Um, so this year we'll have Steve Johnson from MIT talking about crossing language barriers with Julia, SciPy, and IPython. And Ben Nuttall from the Raspberry Pi Foundation talking about Python programming in scientific um, education. Um, so in total it's about 20 talks. Um, we also have poster sessions and um, like 45 minutes of lightning talks. Um, and about 250 attendees, so much smaller than SciPy. So why should you come? It's like smaller than SciPy, it's in Cambridge. So first, <laughs> Cambridge is a great city, but so first I think you should come because of the weather, because I'm sort of, you know, sunny all the time, it's, and this is what the weather looks like in the UK. Um, <laughs> And then there's, so Cambridge is a beautiful city, so there's a lot of old buildings um, and we have a chance to be hosted in Cambridge University, which is like probably one of the most amazing um, universities in the world. Um, and then you get to see, well, more old buildings, and then, well, old buildings again, but it's still very nice. So another thing which is nice about the UK is the food. So actually in Cambridge there are <laughs> something called <laughs> the trailer of life and the trailer of death. Um, we all wonder why grad students call them like this, but apparently after 2 a.m. the food there is absolutely awesome. Not before 2 a.m. <laughs> Um, so we, we have also a lot of social events. So this is a picture taken um, so in Belgium, so traditional uh, Belgium uh, meal. Uh, but so we have, uh, I hope we will be able to organize what we called aspiro. So this is a French tradition of gathering around uh, drinks and it's, it is always fun. Uh, I think some of the people here uh, went to some in Belgium. Um, so just chat with them. Um, and see what it, it's like. Uh, so another thing we do is during poster session, uh, we drink free beer. And by free beer, I mean not only it is free, you don't have to pay for it, but it is actually free, so you can get the recipe on the bottle to do it. So it's like Stallman compatible. <laughs> so come to your side by. Sustainable beer. Yeah. Thank you, Now, Sounds great. Um, next up we have Kurt, and on the, in, the, in the dock we have Mike McCurns. I'm Kurt Smith, work at Enthought. Uh, we're working on a project called Disarray, and it's based off of work that Brian Granger started a while ago, and we picked it up and are continuing, continuing with it. Uh, it's funded by the Department of Energy SBIR program. And what is it? Well, 
Let's start with the lowly, humble NumPy array. And let's think about making it go in parallel and use MPI. But MPI is low level and somewhat difficult to use and that sort of thing. We want to be able to still have our nice, easy to use NumPy array, but have it be using MPI and parallelism behind the scenes somewhat automatically with control and with the ability to have things be explicit and, and that sort of thing and um, when, when it makes sense to do so. Also, what if you have a really big NumPy array? Lots of data in there, right? Well, we have lots of parallel hardware running around. We have, you know, even on our laptops nowadays, we have up to eight to, you know, well, four cores with eight cores with hyperthreading and that sort of thing. Um, we have lots of workstations lying around in our offices, that sort of thing. We also have supercomputers that are fairly straightforward to use nowadays, especially compared to how things were, you know, long, long time ago. So it's, we have all this parallel infrastructure running around, so why can't we get these NumPy arrays to work with MPI on this parallel hardware, but still feel like the NumPy array we know and love? Well, that's the goal of Distray. And the idea here is that the user there sees just a really big, single NumPy array, but actually under the covers, it's broken up into a bunch of little NumPy arrays that each one is handling some part of the data on one of these parallel processes, whether that's running on your laptop or you know, scaling down to smaller execution units through you know, several workstations and a smaller cluster through, up through supercomputer, right? <clears throat> so the user's still just playing with, interacting with this very big NumPy array, but in fact, the whole infrastructure is taking care of um, you know, figuring out where you're interacting with this array, what processes to talk to, that sort of thing, right? And <clears throat> deep down in the core of all this stuff, you can have parallel code running on, you know, next to the data, where the data actually lives. So you can actually say, you know, take this function, this code, this maybe pre-compiled code in Fortran, C, C++, might be Python code, might be Python code that's JIT compiled in some fashion, it might be Cython code, who knows what, we're not really putting any restrictions on what's happening at the local level at all. And we're allowing people to take that code, say, here, run this on the local nodes and allow us to do communication between nodes directly so there isn't this necessarily a bottleneck in the process that the users, user is interacting with directly. Okay. So we've got you know, parallel C++ code, parallel Fortran there. If you notice, I spelled Fortran correctly. There's no reason to shout. It's capital F, lowercase, O-R-T-A-N. And then there's parallel Python, perhaps, parallel Cython, that sort of thing. The other big concept that we're um, trying to capture here is uh, you've got a big NumPy array, and these little arrows that are between the big NumPy array and the, the local arrays, um, they're little because it's really just commands and execution, like do this to your data, right? It's not meant to be a pipeline for lots of data to go back and forth. The data lives locally, and data can go back and forth between the, the local arrays as much as needed, so you can have fully distributed, scalable processes that work, and you, know, you don't have necessarily a bottleneck going back to the single unit at the top there. So as somewhat of a um, use case, take a parallel plasma turbulence simulation. The core of it is 30% Fortran code, and that's the part that's using lots of MPI, it's parallel, lots of communication, that sort of thing. The auxiliary stuff is like 70%. It's initialization, parallel I.O., parallel test suite, that kind of thing. All the futzy, fiddly bits that you have to deal with all the time and probably spend more than 70% of your time dealing with, but it's really not the core of your simulation. That's the stuff that we want to be able to um, write in idiomatic NumPy, essentially, with Distray or something like it. And keep the core in Fortran, let it be fast, let it be scalable, but tap into it, make it much easier to use with something like what we're building with Distray. So we have, um, give me a little, there we are. Um, we have some IPython notebooks, for examples, that sort of thing. Uh, show the different distributions, and then one more slide. And thank you, Kurt. This is what happens when you distribute you. your presentation. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. 
All right, so uh, next we have Sam, and uh, next up front, uh, Mary Jo, if she's around. First one today to do that. Let's see. this. So I'm going to talk to you about what we've been doing uh, in a project called the Dark Sky Simulations. And so this is uh, in collaboration with uh, Matt Turk and Mike Warren who are sitting in the back, uh, as well as a bunch of uh, other people. So the, the basic science goal is uh, we're trying to study the evolution of the universe. And to do, do so, we're going to use a trillion dark matter particles. And a trillion is a large number. Turns out, if you run this simulation, it took about a day. It generated about half a petabyte of data. So it begs the question, how does open data and open science work at this scale? The answer is that it works the same way. You put the data on the web. And that's what we've done. So you can go to our data release, and you can browse around. You can see the metadata. We give you even a tour of how you, you can explore that data. That's all fine and good. Then we did something crazy, and we put a file on the internet. <laughs> How many people have seen a T on that line before? So that's fun. So now, you know, what are you going to do with that? You're going to import YT, and you're going to write a bunch of Python code to, do, to talk directly to that file. So I'm going to show you a quick demo here. So we have this, this code that we put into YT, which is a Python analysis visualization package. And I'm going to load that 32 terabyte file. So it goes out and it looks at it. And now I can do SDF and figure out what parameters are in there. OK, this is a bunch of stuff that relates to the cosmology simulation. What if I want to look at the first particle and its x position? It'll go out there, grab it. It tells me that's, that's fine. What if I want to know where the trillionth particle is? That works, too. And so we wrote analysis around this. So that's fun. But you can do more than that. You can use YT for what it was built to do and analyze and visualize this data. And so note the, the, the website is still there. Uh, and you can actually just directly access particles in this 32 terabyte file that is indexed hierarchically and grab only the stuff you need over the web and analyze it locally. So. We have a project website. You should go check it out. Just to prove that this is not just magic, I'm going to uh, attempt to do this all right here. And instead of plotting that same halo that you just saw, I'm going to plot the 10th most massive halo. There's about 4 billion of them in this, in this simulation. A halo is just a, like a galaxy, a cluster of galaxies. So right now, it's going through. It's finding the 10th halo. It's grabbing those particles. And then as long as the rest of you in the audience aren't right-clicking on that file and saving as, <laughs> this will go through. And I think there's a limit here that uh, is one megasecond. Yeah, so. Yeah. So give this a minute, but uh, this is what we're trying to do. We're trying to write the software around directly addressing the data on the web and, and make it as simple as possible for someone to go and analyze data and reproduce our results. Uh, if you saw Matt's talk earlier, the next step here is put all of this technology into a Chrome browser so that you can just download an app and explore the universe. Oh yeah, it's done.
Danke. Thank you, Sam, for destroying our bandwidth. Uh, next up, we have Mike, and uh, next up front, uh, if we could get Brian Green Chair, that'd be great. Sorry about that. Okay. Uh, hi, uh, Mike McKerns. Uh, I wanted to talk about uh, some, I, I usually talk about tools, but uh, I'm going to talk a little bit more about results. Uh, so you may know me from Dill. This is uh, about the reason I use and, and create Dill. Uh, it's don't be a lemming. Uh, statistically speaking, uh, talking about some of the uncertainty quantification work in Mystic. Um, so it's a tool for statistical science. Uh, and what Mystic can do is uh, it can apply a penalty function uh, to any, um, any abstract optimizer. I can pick an optimizer, I can apply a penalty function. Um, but in addition to that, I can apply uh, constraints in a different way, uh, again, through a decorator or directly, and I can write uh, and apply constraints in a functional way. So if I wanted to say constrain my optimizer to only search in that little white space down there, that oddly shaped white space. If I write a function that can do that, it basically applies it as a constraint operator and lets the optimizer only pick in that space. So that's very nice in applying constraints exactly in multidimensional space. Uh, and if you notice, it says with mean, so you can do it in statistical constraints on inputs or outputs. Uh, and the optimizer allows you to run massively parallel. So uh, this code right here, if you can see it, uh, what it does is runs a couple hundred uh, optimizers parallel, steepest descent optimizers in parallel um, um, with torque MPI. So it spawns a bunch of optimizers out and does a fast uh, ensemble optimization, which is basically global optimization with cheap optimizers. Uh, and then we thought, can we use this to uh, address some questions in statistical science that uh, basically by lifting ourselves from some of the assumptions, uh, can we look at things like um, statistics as a global optimization, which it really can be written as, I'll show in just a second, uh, and, and, and do things like say, we have massive parallelism, uh, can we, you know, probabilistic uh, constraints, can we do this uh, optimization over all of our scenarios, over all the possible things, over all of our priors. Uh, and the math is actually very simple because it's, um, infinite dimensional, <laughs> uh, so it's easy to write. You could see down there the optimal statistical estimator, uh, inf, soup, uh, the expectation value of the, the difference, and what that says is the best worst case for the statistical error taken over all the possible probability distributions, right? That's ugly, and that's why it hasn't been done before. But we actually have a tool that can do it, and you can rewrite things like Bayesian, uh, formulation in, in this uh, form and rewrite the optimal Bayesian prior that you'd find. It's basically an optimization over all priors. Uh, and uh, still infinite dimensional, so to do it on a computer, you use a, com a, a, a physics trick, which is basically build a basis uh, for your uh, wave function or your probability measure, uh, uh, or your probability distribution, and, and then you have a, a bunch of uh, uh, Dirac's or, or, or Gaussians that represent your probability distribution and you do this uh, optimization like you see in the boxes over statistical space and what you are seeing there is you're seeing the optimization condense basically to the scenarios that are the most relevant in the extreme. So those are the extreme points that have the likelihood of happening. So you collapse into the, the, the minimum there. Um, and so uh, with this, uh, we started to get some results. Of course, these are big, nasty problems. They take a while. And one of the results that we got, and actually results that we kept getting with even the simplest cases for statistics under uncertainty, like a means constraint on the output, are that you get discontinuities in the governing behavior like that, discontinuities and jumps. And what that does is it violates the basic assumption that most statistical methods make, that there's regularity, well-posedness, and also that uh, misspecific, we, we found from that that we actually it blows the concept that if you are close enough, it's good enough. 
actually, if you are close enough, it's no better than being absolutely wrong or random. So uh, what does that say? It says, hey, we have a new method now that we can augment existing methods with, that if you do this ahead of time and check and make sure that it's true, uh, then you can say, hey, I have verified results. I, I, I know I'm getting a guaranteed answer. And uh, if you don't do it, then uh, your, your predictions are, are no better than making a random guess. Uh, so, so it's a fairly serious impact. Uh, uh, there's our references, and uh, if you, uh, we're actually, I, I, I'm a board member on a foundation, and we're looking to help uh, fund and augment uh, some statistical science software. So please come talk to me. And thank you, Mike. <laughs> Um, next up is Mary Jo, and, after, and next up on the dock is, uh, um, sorry, Ben Root. Thanks. Oops. Pete? Where's my slideshow? Oh, there it is. There's bad news and there's good news. The bad news is, no matter where you work, there are no guarantees. A couple of days ago at a BOF, I heard people talk about, where are the scientific programming jobs? Where can I find them? And then I heard a lot of people lamenting about soft money. And I'm up here to tell you that I'm living proof that soft money is not so bad. I started working at the National Snow and Ice Data Center 21 years ago, and I've been funded on soft money ever since. It's not so bad. The good news is you usually have more choices than you think you do. So I want to tell you about some opportunities that we have. We have job openings right now. I'm happy to talk about any of them if anybody's interested or finding, interested in finding out more about us. We're in Boulder, Colorado. We're a full service data center. We're mostly funded by NASA. We have about two thirds of our funding that's NASA funding for a distributed active archive center. The thing that I think is interesting to the people in this room is that we manage and distribute scientific data, but we also have scientists who are right down the hall who use it and in some cases produce it. That's one of the things that external reviewers have basically said is our strength because we're not just a bucket of bits. Earlier this week, anybody listen to the radio? Earlier this week on Marketplace, they had this thing where they said, can you call in and, and describe your job in five words? And I didn't call in, and I didn't do that, but I started thinking about it. I thought, God, what would I do? And this is it. The climate's changing. But the thing that is really cool about NSIDC is that people care about doing, doing it in, in a sound way. You know, you can't really say you're doing the right research. You can't really say you're getting the right answers. But people care about doing things the right way. So, without further ado, if I can, how do I get out of this thing? Go to a browser. I want to show you something. Oh, resolution is terrible. Okay, so we're the people in Boulder that you usually hear about on the news. We're one of the groups that are tracking Arctic sea ice. And I don't know how to make this thing so that you can see the whole screen. Pinch in. There we go. That's better. So. Our developers and our science programmers, every quarter they take a week and they do uh, technical debt work and they do hackathon stuff. And we had a guy who had been working at the data center for about six weeks and he said, so what's that, you know, that Arctic data that you guys have? Can I just like see it on the web? And everybody said, well, yeah, but you have to open up the files and they're HDF and there's this and you have to do that and then you do this. And he said, really? That's totally lame. 
And so for a hackathon day, he put together this thing that he called Charctic. And you're seeing live data. This green line here is where the sea ice is as of, I don't know, a couple days ago, yesterday, theoretically. Um, and he put together this thing that answers that question that Edward Tufte always talks about, which is compared to what? And people liked it so much that somebody else found a little more funding and they said, can you make that so that we can actually release it to the public? Here's another example of some of the work that these guys do. It's totally cool. We had a NASA program manager come up to us in August last year and he said, I've got some extra money in my budget. I know that sounds like a fantasy, but he really did. And, and he said, and you guys have a whole bunch of really cool data from satellites that NASA has paid for and I want to be able to make it available to policymakers, so it doesn't have to be any big analysis tool or anything. Just make maps for them so that they can understand what's happening. And this was the result. I can show you. In a couple of months, what these guys pulled together was a summary of your work Important is so sets. cool, it's frozen. Thank you very much. <laughs> Brian, and then uh, next up uh, is Kyle Kelly. I'm actually really looking forward to Kyle's talk. It's going to be uh, pretty exciting. So, uh, I don't know about you, but I've had a fantastic time at SciPy. Uh, we go to a lot of conferences and talk to a lot of people all over the world uh, as part of our work on IPython. And uh, SciPy, this conference, is really our home community. And, and every time we come here, we feel like we're coming home to family. And uh, I, this is, I think, reflected in a lot of the relationships that are here. Uh, there's people here that I have known and been interacting with for the better part of a decade, and uh, it's fantastic to see everyone again. Um, but this talk is actually, uh, or the, my lightning talk is actually about NumFocus, and uh, so how many here uh, listen to NPR sometimes? All right, so as you know, every once in a while, maybe every six months, NPR stops their regular uh, programming and has a, a fun drive, right? And they bring the tar car talk guys on to talk about how you should give to NPR. And uh, I tried to get them to come down from Boston, the car talk guys, they were busy, so you're stuck with me instead. So uh, how many people here from industry who are currently working in industry, hands? And uh, how many people in academia or nonprofit? Fantastic. Um, it's exciting to see uh, more people from, in from industry here. Um, another question, how many people here have contributed to an open source project in this ecosystem? Wow, that's absolutely fantastic. So I went, went on to uh, OLO, which is a website that summarizes uh, statistics and various aspects of open source projects. And uh, they have one metric. It's a model that looks at source code and tries to estimate how many person years of effort have gone into a project. And I looked up the numbers for IPython, NumPy, SciPy, SimPy, Matplotlib, and Pandas, sort of the core SciPy stack. And between those uh, six projects, Olo estimates that there's just under 400 person years of effort, right? And so when you look around at the people who raise their hands, uh, you've got uh, between these people and obviously a lot of other people all over the world, a significant effort in open source software being put uh, to use for open science. And that's really the goal of NumFocus. The idea, the core idea of NumFocus is that open code leads to open science. Uh, the goal of NumFocus, uh, according to the website, is to promote and support the ongoing research and development of open source computing tools through educational community and public channels. Some of the main activities that NumFocus is engaged in, uh, they uh, organize and sponsor the PyData conference. They offer, offer a fiscal sponsorship for uh, a number of the open source projects in the community. Uh, IPython is one of those projects, uh, SimPy, um, and there's other projects that NumFocus is currently talking with uh, to bring on in that capacity as well. Uh, they offer the John Hunter Technical Fellowship, the first of which was just 
uh, awarded recently. Uh, and they also have uh, other activities promoting and encouraging women in technology. And uh, one thing I think is important is to, to, to understand what happens when people give to NumFocus. And so really, I want to sort of talk about our experience with IPython and NumFocus. Uh, as many of you may know, uh, we got a very generous donation uh, from Microsoft Corporation. It came in uh, through NumFocus. This is about a year ago, and it was targeted towards IPython. And I want to talk very briefly about uh, what's happened as a result of that. So how many people here have used uh, or are planning on using the uh, IPython widgets that came out in IPython 2? Fantastic. How many people here have ever viewed a notebook uh, on NB Viewer or a static HTML page? All right. So uh, with the money that Microsoft uh, gave us, we were able to hire a recent grad from Cal Poly, uh, Jonathan Frederick. I'll have him stand up for a second. You saw his lightning talk on the devious JS object the other day. So we hired Jonathan to work full time. And uh, Jonathan has been one of the lead developers on IPython who has implemented a lot of the NB convert machinery and the NB viewer machinery, and then also the widgets. And so my main point is that when we build support, uh, fiscal support for NumFocus, real things happen. This is not money that gets given and sort of evaporates into the ether and you'll never quite know what happens. Uh, real practical work that benefits the community uh, gets done. That's basically it. Um, the last thing, uh, can uh, Leah please stand? Leah is the uh, chief uh, cat herder for NumFocus and makes sure that things get done. And then also, are there other board members for NumFocus here? I think a few, Andy, Fernando, Perry. Please talk to any of us and donate to NumFocus. Thanks. Thank you, Brian. <laughs> McDougall? All right. Thanks. Hey, everybody. I'm Kyle Kelly. Uh, first up. Who loves Phil's coffee? Anybody? Paul, you've won some free coffee. Here, get up here. <laughs> Sweet. See if we can get working. I should plug in first. Uh oh. Of course. While Kyle sets this up, I should tell you Phil's coffee is amazing. <laughs> if you're ever in the San Francisco Bay Area, do check it out. Um, it's so amazing. Facebook has it on their own campus. They have their own Phil's coffee. Shoot it's spelled with a Z. Be a better adapter. No. Oh, okay. Just be a lot of demos. No. Bring up display. Bring up display. You still get free coffee. Sweet. Come on up. Right. <laughs> totally oh. legit website. <laughs> okay. Uh, I do love artisanally crafted pour over coffee. And I do wish it was free. I pay a lot. It's like $3 for a small. It's, it's pour over though, so it's okay. It's really good. 
Okay, what do I do? I do this. Exclusive gift card code. That's awesome. Uh, now I do Apple C. That's, uh, I know enough. Okay. Free coffee, sweet. Cool, there we go. Did anything happen? Yeah, I'm trying to see. Oh, oh, because it's, you know, they have, to, they have to identify me, right? Is that, is cool. that enough? Thanks. Cool. I'll have to buy your coffee now. Sweet. <laughs> awesome. Okay. So what I wanted to show there was what? <laughs> a vulnerability in the IPython notebook that was patched um, in 1.2 and in 2.0. Not cool, Kyle. <laughs> right. So we all know the, the notebook runs code on your laptop or your server, Raspberry Pi, wherever you want, from your browser. Um, JavaScript uh, sends your code over to the notebook server and over to the kernel, and it uses kernel.execute to reach them. Right. So you're logged in, you write your code, it sends it over to the notebook server, communicates back with the kernel, sends results back to your browser. There was an issue though. So let's say you open a different tab. I'd, I'd say the totally legit Phil's Coffee website that was <laughs> displayed earlier. Uh, that, that same, the same path that you're in right now, so you can't access you're usually protected by cross-origin requests from your browser, but aren't necessarily protected from WebSockets that are cross-origin. So WebSocket, wherever your, uh, your notebook is running and then the kernels. And so if you go to some arbitrary website that happened to connect to the right kernel, they could execute code on your machine. So in this case, you know, we're connected to the server, and we open a different tab, we go to it, somehow they get a kernel ID, and then they're able to run code instantly. In the case for Paul, he got his picture taken by photo booth, which of course is not really that malicious, but still practical. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so there are mitigations for this. The kernel ID is a UUID, it's randomly generated, uh, using an authenticated notebook server protects you from this issue. Uh, it's been fixed in IPython 1.2 and the 2.x series. Um, yeah. So security. <laughs> A lot of things have been changed in the, in the notebook format. You've noticed that we're signing notebooks now to make sure that if you load a notebook from someone else that you want code that runs on that page, because JavaScript can run well before any code, like you explicitly enter to run code. And so we've stopped that ahead of time. We're protecting against the cross-origin web sockets. Um, and if other things come up, like if you notice something that might be sketchy that needs to be fixed, like email us, let us know, we'll, we'll fix it right away. Thank you, Kyle. I feel much safer knowing that I have Paul's picture available. <laughs> I trusted you, Kyle. <laughs> Thank you for that totally not rigged demo. <laughs> Sit up there now. All right, just a little bit of context for this. Uh, about eight or so years ago, the company I worked for, well before I ever arrived, they made a mandate from on high that all software that we make that needs config files would use XML. Yeah, I, I was not happy when I found out that. Uh, found out that. So configuration file control the behavior of complicated software. You need to be a, they are a safe, easy to understand mechanism for non-developers and also non-technical users. So it could be you know, somebody who you know, just 
operations who's going to be there at 3 o'clock in the morning who needs to go and modify things uh, when things go bad. Monkey see, monkey do. Config files are very nice most of the time. When they're done right, they can see, oh, I got values here and I got things. They can pretty much figure out how to add more stuff or to take things out. It's pretty self-explanatory. They need to be mimicable, they need to be flexible enough. You know, just because somebody didn't put in something in a quote, eh, you'd like it to still work. And they're self-documenting. So it has all the essential descriptions. How many times have you gone into some random config file in the etsy directory and you could actually figure out how to modify your Apache server? So the, here's an example of a human readable config file. Yeah. It's readable, all right. So let's take a look at something a little different. JSON. It, this actually looks very, very familiar to us. You know, it got curly braces and square brackets and lists and stuff. You know, this is starting to look really, really, you know, useful. It's a bit more concise, whereas XML was overly verbose. It's tedious to write in XML, but Jason, you know, we're all Python programmers. This is, you know, fairly straightforward. Uh, very easy to read. And with XML, the tools and stuff are all geared towards serialization or heavyweight. It, 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 you get these special objects back. Nobody wants to play with it. Meanwhile, you, know, you load up a JSON file, you get, you get Python objects that you're used to. That's great. That's wonderful. Isn't this great? No comments allowed in JSON. <laughs> so, I am here now to testify. I have been told so many times about this other great thing. I'm telling you, the human readable isn't good enough. It may actually be quite bad. Could you actually take it away by giving you a false sense of security? How about human usable? YAML. I have seen the light. I am now a convert. YAML. Guess what? If you already know JSON, you already know a little bit of YAML. Because <laughs> oddly enough, JSON is a subset of YAML. So if you have a JSON file, you automatically can read it with a YAML thing. But you can even be more concise in YAML than you are in JSON. It supports comments. That, that alone sold me. You can describe sections with the comments and, and individual elements, which is all very important for configuration and lets you comment things out and do all sorts. It's great. And more so, you can, you can support references. You can actually reference a particular section and say, okay, this is you know, something, and then later on you can just simply uh, use that section again so you can maintain a structure to your config file. It's a bit of an advanced feature, but it maintains logical consistency in your configuration. Uh, easy to install, easy to use. I mean, literally, it's that. That two steps. Look, how, how many times do you see on Stack Overflow instructions on how to load an XML file? And then, you know, you just have dictionaries and lists. I mean, it, it, there's nothing special about it. It all works beautifully and it's cross-platform supported so you can get YAML readers and other languages as well, which was the original reason why my company chose XML because there was XML readers in all sorts of languages. Yeah, we just do it once and we never have to worry about it again, except nobody wants to write config files. So, you can read more about YAML and I uh, hope many of you see the light. Thank you. Ben. And our last lightning talk of the conference will be by uh, Damon McDougall. So, a bunch of us were at the bar last night. 
and um, we talked about packaging and we solved all of the packaging problems. And Anthony decided to call me Damon, British guy McDougall, so this should really be my first slide. Um, while we were at the bar, I met this guy. Um, I don't actually know what his name is, so we're going to call him Jim. I met Jim, and Jim heard me, Matt Terry, and a, a Russian lady whose name I've forgotten, I, I apologize. We were talking about the lightning talks, and Jim was super interested, and he said, can you talk about anything? Can you talk, like, how long is it? He was asking about the format. You know, we said it's five minutes. Yes, you can talk about anything. Jim said, talk about waffles. <laughs> I don't remember Jim's name, so let's call him Waffle Guy. Yes, this is happening. <laughs> I am going to talk about waffles. And Jim said one thing to me. <laughs> Jim had to have the history. Like all of us, we're scientists, we need the history. Git gives us the history, Jim wanted the history. Jim, you get the history. But what do I do to find out about waffle history? Well, I do exactly the same thing I do when I get um, questions about how to use a matplotlib function when I'm at work. <laughs> and the answer is I Google it and then click the first Stack Overflow link. <laughs> I don't know how to use matplotlib. And notice, I don't click the matplotlib documentation, I click the Stack Overflow link. <laughs> Let me tell you, there have been two times Stack Overflow has been down in the last two months. I guarantee there are millions of man hours wasted per hour of downtime that Stack Overflow has. Um, so, yes, we're, this is happening. <laughs> waffles are preceded by wafers. And by wafers, I mean, you know, the communion wafers you eat in church. And these happen around the 9th century. This is a wafer iron from the 9th century. It looks badass. It's got, like, embellishing, uh, 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 embossings, and it's very pixelated. The first waffle recipe, published anonymously. Uh, notice it's French. It's not Belgian. Just FYI, all the French people. It's French. French fries are Belgian. The recipe is egg, salt, wine, flour. You fill the waffle iron. Happiness ensues. Here's the actual history. Let's do this. Whistle stop tour. 13th to the 14th century, only speculation of waffle irons existing. 15th century, there's, a, there's a, an actual distinction between waffle iron and communion wafer iron. 16th century, paintings depict the modern waffle form. 17th century, unsweetened and honey sweetened waffles enter the scene. More sugar, sugar prices plummet, sugar is good, sugar kills everyone. 18th century, waffles get names to Desert Lake City of Origin. Also when the English word waffle first appears, so thank you, 18th century. 19th century, waffles popular despite the pesky Brits inflating sugar prices, which then dropped and other candies appeared, leading to the waffle death. Uh, the Brits inflating waffle prices was a naval uh, blockade, that's why that happened. Uh, the 20th century, waffle re re recipes become rare and only 29 prof professional waffle chefs are in Paris. Americans take up the Belle Jam waffle in the 50s or 60s. The name sticks so we now have the concept of the Belgian waffle. You are welcome. Meals. Breakfast, waffles, bacon, syrup. We can't just eat waffles for every meal, we've got to make this stuff fancy. For lunch, lunch and meat, niswa salad, yeah, make it fancy, get fancy. Here's some pictures to make it even fancier. I would eat the crap out of this. This looks awesome. I, this, this was on Reddit, I just, I was like, okay. However, there is one problem. What about Austin? Austin is full of hipsters and indie kids. How do we appease them? Should we make waffles in the shape of skinny jeans? We can do better than this. I kid you not, I bought Tylenol, a paracetamol for the Brits, from HEB, and they had to put on the front of the bottle that it was gluten-free. <laughs> this, this actually happened. I, this is my cupboard, I own this thing. Jim, how did I do? Thank you. Thank you. Well, it looks like someone lost a bet. <laughs> Where's my waffle, Matt? <laughs> um, all right, so thank you for coming to the Lightning Talks. Let's give a round of applause to all of our speakers and waffle experts. 
One final announcement. Um, we have sprints tomorrow morning.